UK is published extensively and more than 80 peer reviewed articles are published some of them being natogenetics bmj plus medicine plus genetics etc a few to mention and he has to his credit a few book chapters his main week work is on nutrition lifestyle and cardiometabolic uh, diseases and he has written got a lot of media attention because of his work and received funds as pi something to the tune of two and a half million pounds in the last five to seven years and in 2020 last year he won the uk nutrition society silver medal award for his contribution to the world of global nutrition so i'll stop at this because it's very extensive his uh, uh, cv i would say and i would request uh, dr vimal to start his lecture please thank you Uh, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful introduction. So uh, let me share the slides. Sir, with your permission, before uh, Professor Vimal starts, I have just a few housekeeping announcements to make. Uh, uh, the question and answers uh, session will be post the lecture of Professor Vimal Karani and kindly post all your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. They will be uh, taken, moderated, depending on the time. Uh, Professor Vimal Karani already has to uh, leave for another meeting. So right after his lecture, we'll uh, take questions related to his talk. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah. OK, great. Um, so um, a very good morning to everyone. And thank you all so much uh, for joining the session today. And um, thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to be a part of this event. So today I'm going to talk to you all about uh, the role of nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics uh, in terms of studying the role of maternal diet on the offspring's health status. So one of the underlying bases on which like we do all these nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics research is based on the gene environment interactions, the interactions between the genetic factors and the environmental factors, and which is what is determining the development of cardiometabolic diseases. So there are several lifestyle factors, including dietary intake and physical activity. And also there are multiple genetic factors which can contribute to the development of cardiometabolic diseases. And several studies have demonstrated the relationship between genes and obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So in terms of developing a cardiometabolic disease, it's basically the interaction between the genetic and the lifestyle factors which contributes to the development of obesity or diabetes or cardiovascular disease or even cancer. So the underlying basis is basically the genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. Even if you have a high genetic risk, you can still overcome that genetic risk by modifying your environment. So with this background, let's move on to what is nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. For those who do not know this area of nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics, the nutrigenetics refers to the study of the impact of DNA sequence variation on chronic disease outcomes in response to a particular diet. So for example, if you have a high genetic risk and you're consuming an unhealthy diet, so what is the interaction between these two factors and how they contribute to the development of obesity or diabetes? And study of this gene diet interaction is what you call as a nutrigenetic study. Whereas nutrigenomics, as the name implicates, Omics is the expression, genomics is a gene expression, and nutrigenomics is the impact of the nutrient on gene expression. The food that we are consuming, it goes inside our body, and the nutrients get absorbed, and these nutrients enter into the cell, binds to the DNA, and regulate the gene expression. And this study is what you call as nutrigenomics. And findings from nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics are essential for the implementation of the personalized diets. That is where you're developing an optimum diet for an individual based on that individual's genetic makeup. And that's what we call as the personalized nutrition. So let me give you an overview about the nutrigenetic studies that I'm running in developed and developing parts of the world. 
So in developed parts of the world, I'm focusing on a large collaborative network, which is called as a Decardia collaboration, which was initially funded by the British Art Foundation. We have been running this large collaborative network for the last 10 years. And we have more than 35 studies with data from more than 100,000 people from different parts of the UK, US and European countries. And with access to the UK Biobank, which has got half a million people and with data from various consortia based studies, we have a sample size of less than nearly about 2 million people. And these are some of the publications from the Decardia collaboration. So the main message over here is like, we have well-established cohorts and data from developed parts of the world, or in other words, Western parts of the world. So what's happening in lower middle income countries with regards to the nutrigenetic analysis? Well, I started this genuine collaboration. Genuine stands for the gene nutrient interactions. And this collaborative network was funded by the British Nutrition Foundation. And these are the countries in which I've implemented the nutrigenetic studies for the first time um, with the help of the funds from various funding organizations, which you see in the brackets. So briefly touching upon the genuine collaboration. So it's been seven years with the aim of uh, implementing the nutrigenetic studies in contrasting ethnic groups. The first study was implemented in the Indian population, then Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Brazil, in Ghanaian population, Turkey, and also in Peruvian population. We are also running other um, nutrigenetic studies in other lower middle income countries, in addition to the ongoing collaborations in developed parts of the world. And we are also comparing the data from the Caucasians with that of the South Asians and various other ethnic groups. And these are some of the publications from the genuine collaboration. So today, uh, given the theme of this uh, particular event, so I'm going to focus mainly on um, the studies like where I've done some research uh, activities with regards to looking at the maternal diet and also looking at uh, uh, women. So one of the studies that I've done as part of the genuine collaboration is basically where we conducted a population-based survey to assess the effect of the nutritional status and genetic factors on non-communicable disease in Indonesian Minangkabau women. So well, Minangkabau is the world's largest matrilineal community. So we decided to look at this community and uh, given the high prevalence of cardiovascular diseases in this particular population. So we thought this might be a very good target in terms of preventing um, the development of cardiometabolic uh, diseases in future generation. So the first nutrigenetic study was implemented in this uh, Southeast Asian population, Minangkabau women, and uh, as part of the genuine collaboration. So we found a very interesting interaction between protein consumption and obesity genetic risk on uh, waist circumference. So in this graph on the x-axis, you find the totals of protein intake. On the y-axis, you find the waist circumference, which is an indicator of central obesity. The red bar is basically high genetic risk and the white bar with dots is basically low genetic risk. And if you focus on those um, Indonesian women who were consuming low amounts of protein rich foods. So here you can see that those who have a high genetic risk, in spite of having high genetic risk, by reducing the intake of the protein, they were able to overcome the genetic risk of central obesity. The waist circumference was much lower, even though they had a high genetic risk, by consuming a low protein diet, they were able to overcome the genetic risk. So when I say low protein diet, the message is not that you have to reduce your protein consumption. You're the lowest turtile, the dietary intake, the mean intake of protein was nearly about 70 grams. So the dietary intake, the dietary recommendations for the Indonesian population is basically nearly 70 to 75 grams of protein per day. But if you look at the highest turtile, they were consuming about nearly 140 grams of protein per day, which is double the amount of what is actually required. So sticking on to the universal dietary recommendation or in terms of the dietary recommendations for the Indonesian population, that would be an effective strategy in terms of overcoming the genetic risk of obesity for these Indonesian women. And also another study where we focused on the B12 deficiency. So we wanted to know whether the B12 genetic risk, so genetic risk of having B12 deficiency, whether that was related to cardiometabolic diseases through a dietary influence. So here we found an interaction between the B12 genetic risk and dietary fiber consumption on HbA1c levels, glycated hemoglobin, which is an indicator of type two diabetes. So in this graph on the x-axis, you find the totals of dietary fiber. On the y-axis, you find the HbA1c and the red bar B12 genetic risk and the blue bar, which is a low B12 genetic risk. So if you look at those Indonesian women who were consuming low amounts of fiber-rich foods, which is basically the unhealthy diet, 
And those who had a high genetic risk, they had significantly higher levels of HPA1C, that is glycated hemoglobin, implicating that improving or increasing the fiber-rich foods as part of their diet might be an effective way to overcome the genetic risk of having higher glycated hemoglobin levels. And we also looked at the vitamin D deficiency where we found a very interesting interaction between the vitamin D genetic risk, that is genetic risk of having very significantly lower 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentrations and carbohydrate intake on body fat percentage. So in this graph on the x-axis, you find the turtles of carbohydrate intake. The black bar is high genetic risk and the white bar is low vitamin D genetic risk. And on the y-axis, you find the body fat percentage as an indicator of obesity or the body fat percentage, uh, body fat distribution. So here you can see that those individuals who were consuming high amounts of carb-rich foods and those who had a high genetic risk, they had significantly higher levels of body fat percentages. So reducing the carbohydrate intake and improving the fiber-rich foods might be an effective way to overcome all these genetic risks in these Indonesian um, populations. So that was actually a very interesting finding and also a take-home message for, uh, for this particular Minangkabau community. So the take-home message over here based on these nutrigenetic studies is that the genetic factors and the lifestyle factor, they do not work independent of each other. Rather, they work together, interact together, contributing to the development of obesity and various other cardiometabolic diseases. That is, even if you have a high genetic risk, you can still overcome that genetic risk by adopting a healthy lifestyle. So if you're interested in knowing what I'm doing in other parts of the lower middle income countries, feel free to go into this publication, which is available online, which is about the genuine collaboration. So these are some of the press release of the findings from the genuine collaboration. So as mentioned before, the main message is that like a healthy lifestyle can overcome the genetic risk of heart disease or diabetes or obesity as well. So it doesn't matter like whether your levels of genetic risk is high or low or moderate, you can still overcome the genetic risk by modifying your lifestyle. So moving on to nutrigenomics, as mentioned before, uh, which is about the study of the role of nutrients in gene expression. So it all starts with the diet that you're consuming. The food that you're consuming has got all the nutrients, macronutrients, micronutrients. So these nutrients need to be absorbed eventually, right? So when they get absorbed, what happens? These nutrients enter into the cell, they reach the cytoplasm, and there is a molecule which is eagerly waiting for this nutrient. And that molecule is nothing but the transcription factor. And there are two important functions for the transcription factor. One is to bind to the nutrient and secondly, take the nutrient to the nucleus where you have the DNA. So these nutrients, they go and bind to the DNA along with the transcription factor. They provide the energy, they nourish the DNA and convert the DNA to RNA and RNA to proteins and proteins to metabolites. So the study of the expression of the RNA in response to a particular nutrient, and that study is what you call as a transcriptomics, and the study of the expression of the proteins in response to a particular nutrient, and that study is a proteomics, and the study of the expression of the metabolites in response to a nutrient, and that study is called metabolomics. So all these omics approaches, they come under one big umbrella, which is the nutrigenomics. So understanding the differences in the gene expression profile in response to a nutrient, these differences, they serve as a molecular biomarkers and understanding the mechanism by which how the nutrient is influencing the gene expression, that will help us to prevent the development of the diseases. How? Through implementation of the personalized meal plans. So this is how you translate the findings from nutrigenomics to personalized nutrition. So let me give you an example of an integrated omics approach which has been used for predicting the infant's neurodevelopmental outcomes. So it's basically a study that was published in the year 2014, even though it's an, uh, it's, it's an old study, but still this approach could be implemented in, uh, at the moment, like in terms of developing an integrated platform to prevent the development of non-communicable diseases when these infants become adults. So in this study, what they did was they collected the placental biopsy samples, and these samples were used for creating a biobank. And using these samples, they generated data from metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomics. And these data were integrated together, which was used for developing a molecular signature using the bioinformatics tools. And this signature was used for predicting the infant's neurodevelopmental outcome. And in this study, 
Samples were also obtained from the infant, which was integrated into the biofan, and they also generated the omics data. So this kind of an integrated omics approach from the placental sample and the infant's uh, profile, so this will allow us to retrospectively compare with the placental profile and also prospectively compare with that of the infant neurodevelopmental outcome. And this is exactly the platform that we need at the moment in terms of predicting and preventing the development of non-communicable diseases in future. So let me also go on to this nutri-epigenetics area of research. So we have seen nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. And nutri-epigenetics, again, like epigenetics is a non-genetic area of research. And why do we say non-genetic? Because we are focusing only on the changes in the gene expression. We are not worried about the DNA. So the, there's no change in the DNA. It's basically the change in the gene expression. So that's why we say epigenetics is basically a change in the phenotype without a change in the genotype. Genotype is your genetic representation and the phenotype is a physical representation. And one of the most commonly and extensively studied epigenetic modification is the DNA methylation. So where one of the four nucleotides in the DNA, which is a cytosine, which gets methylated. And how is this methylation taking place? That is in response to your dietary intake. If you're consuming a methyl-rich diet, then the methyl donors, these methyl groups gets added on to the cytosine. But if you're consuming um, a, a diet which is free of methyl donors, which is basically an unhealthy diet, then there are no methyl groups to get added on to the cytosine. So that's how the DNA methylation is controlling the gene expression. So there's a very strong nutriepigenetic link between the maternal diet and the fetal growth. So that's why we say the first 1000 days of a child's life is very crucial. So studies have clearly shown that the unbalanced maternal diet during pregnancy can have an impact on the fetal growth and which can later on have an impact on the cardiovascular disease risk in adulthood. And also the seasonal variations in maternal methyl donor nutrient intake during the periconceptional period can have an impact on the maternal plasma biomarkers and which in turn can result in differential methylation. And also obesity during pregnancy and diabetes during pregnancy, which is the gestational diabetes, they have all shown to result in DNA methylation changes at birth, and they have remained postnatally. And quite recently, in the last few years, there are a lot of studies which have been carried out in terms of looking at the micronutrient deficiencies during pregnancy, and which can influence the DNA methylation and leading to the abnormalities in fetal growth. So let me focus briefly about this, like a study that we did, which is a vitamin D pregnant mother cohort study in Indonesia. So this study, like basically we looked at the pregnant mothers, 200 pregnant, pregnant mothers who were uh, followed up right from the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. And we also carried out the newborn anthropometric measurements. And we also measured the vitamin D status in the first trimester and third trimester. Interestingly, in the first part of the study, we identified that the pregnant mothers in the third trimester who had high genetic risk, they also had significant vitamin, significantly lower levels of 25 roxy vitamin D concentration. That is, pregnant mothers who had high genetic risk also had vitamin D deficiency. And these pregnant mothers who had high genetic risk and those who had significantly lower levels of vitamin D levels, those pregnant mothers, they gave birth to babies which had a small head circumference. And you know that the small head circumference has been shown to be strongly correlated with the development of cardiometabolic diseases when these infants become adults. So which is a clear indication of the fact that micronutrient deficiencies during pregnancy can have a significant impact on the fetal growth. The other study is basically a Helena study. So in this study, they looked at nearly about 945 adolescent kids and you, with the help of the health records, they were able to get the duration of the breastfeeding as well. So here in this graph on the x-axis, you find the duration of the breastfeeding, never breastfed, less than three months of breastfeeding, three to five months and more than six months. And the black bar is low genetic risk and the white bar is a high genetic risk. And on the y-axis, you find the BMI. So in this study, you can clearly see that those adolescent kids who were never breastfed and those who had high genetic risk, they had significantly higher levels of BMI, which was a similar effect which was seen for waist circumference and also for uh, skin fold thickness. So this is clearly indicative of the fact that the first 1000 days of a child's life is very crucial in terms of preventing cardiometabolic diseases in future.
So foods rich in methyl donors are very, very important because what you do and what you eat in these first 1000 days, it makes a huge difference for the rest of your life. So let me share an ongoing study, which is basically where we are looking at the first trimester vitamin B12 levels and gestational diabetes. So let me give you a brief overview about why are we looking at B12 in relation to gestational diabetes? So you know that the gestational diabetes can be detected only in the second or third trimester. And the prevalence of gestational diabetes, you know that in the UK population, it's about five to 7%. And in the South Asian population, it's 20%. And the difference in the prevalence could be attributed to the genetic susceptibility as well. So the risk, the genetic risk of gestational diabetes is higher in the South Asian mothers. And maternal B12 deficiency. We know that the B12 deficiency has been shown to be associated with obesity, insulin resistance, and also with gestational diabetes. But B12 deficiency can be detected in the first trimester. So we have like a, 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 a kind of a period like where B12 deficiency can be detected in the first trimester, whereas the gestational diabetes can be detected only in the second or third trimester. So if B12 deficiency is causally associated with gestational diabetes, then correcting the B12 deficiency in the first trimester, you can prevent the development of gestational diabetes. So our hypothesis was basically whether B12 supplementation in the first trimester could be an effective strategy for preventing the development of gestational diabetes. But in order to confirm this hypothesis, what we need to validate is basically a causal relationship between vitamin B12 deficiency and gestational diabetes. But if you do a kind of an epidemiological study, then there is high level of confounding and reverse causation. So over, to overcome this confounding and reverse causation problem, we used a genetic approach, which is called as a Mendelian randomization approach. The Mendelian randomization approach is basically a kind of a genetic epidemiological tool, which could be used for examining the causal relationship between exposure and the outcome. Here, the exposure is B12 deficiency and the outcome is gestational diabetes. So in order to implement this approach, we are using some study population data from the UK population. So where we are looking at the Caucasian pregnant mothers living in the UK and South Asian pregnant mothers living in the UK, and also with the help of the existing data from South Asian pregnant mothers living in India and other South Asian countries. So we are basically not only comparing just India with uh, South Asia, but basically we are comparing the white pregnant mothers with that of the um, South Asian uh, pregnant mothers. And also we are looking at the South Asian pregnant mothers living in the UK with that of the white, South, uh, white pregnant mothers living in the UK. So this kind of a comparison is not only comparing two different countries, but also comparing different geographical locations and uh, different genetic, different levels of genetic susceptibility and differences in the dietary intake in the UK as well as in uh, South Asia. So what are the future prospects of the study? So if I'm able to confirm this causal relationship, then before going into the level of implementing B12 supplementation during pregnancy, we need to confirm that with help of the other markers as well, which, is, which could be the epigenetic markers, which could be used as proxies for B12 deficiency, and also carry out the dietary intervention study to confirm this causal relationship. And that could lead to the prevention of gestational diabetes by implementing the plan for screening for B12 deficiency in the first trimester, which could save two lives. And that is exactly the aim of this particular project. And I hope I'll have some interesting findings um, maybe in a year or so. So last but not least, let me touch upon the impact of the diet on gut microbiome. So we have seen nutrigenetics, nutrigenomics, and also we have seen epigenetics where the, the food that you're consuming, it's interacting with your DNA, your gene expression, your proteins, your metabolites, but also the food that you're consuming, it also interacts with the microorganisms which are present in the gut lumen. So the gut microbiome, it plays a very important role in boosting your immunity, maintaining your physiological state, and also in terms of maintaining your mental health. And that's all because of the short chain fatty acids which are produced from this gut microbiome, which are basically the acetic acid, propionic acid, and butric acid, which are all produced in response to the diet, the healthy diet, like foods rich in fiber rich foods, and also the probiotic foods that you're consuming. They can all nourish the gut microbiome and lead to the uh, secretion of production of all these short chain fatty acids. And there's a very strong link 
uh, that has been established between the maternal diet, especially during and after pregnancy, and also the offspring gut microbiome. The maternal diet is the one that influences the maternal microbiota composition and also determines the development of the infant's immune cells, because that is exactly the one which will determine the early innate immune system development and also neurodevelopment of the infant. And not only in terms of the immunity, but also in terms of other cardiometabolic diseases, because of maternal obesity has been shown to play a very important role in regulating the gut microbiome. So there are several studies which have clearly demonstrated that lean women, they have a normal gut microbiome, whereas obese mothers, they seem to have a disrupted gut microbiome, or that's what we call that as a gut microbiome dysbiosis. And um, of course, the mothers are the ones like who are basically transferring the gut microbiome to the next generation. So the lean mothers are likely to transfer the healthy gut microbiome, and obese mothers are likely to transfer the disrupted gut microbiome to their uh, um, to the fetus. So that's likely to result in an offspring with adverse metabolic outcomes. So in a way, in terms of preventing the development of these non-communicable diseases, one way to prevent all this would be to, to also nourish the gut microbiome. Importance to be given not only to the DNA, but equal importance also need to be given to the kind of diets which could nourish the gut microbiome as well. So looking at the precision nutrition, because we are all talking about personalized nutrition, which is purely based on uh, looking at your genetic makeup, but like we need to follow a holistic approach of looking at precision nutrition, where a deep phenotyping is required, because I've already focused on this side of the phenotyping, uh, phenotyping measures, like looking at the dietary intake, the genetic, epigenetic, gut microbiome, metabolomics, and proteomics. But what I haven't focused in my talk today is basically about looking at the stress factors, the sleep pattern, your age, the geographical condition, your socioeconomic status, the early life, the first 1000 days of a child's life. So all these factors need to be taken into consideration before implementing precision nutrition. But the key question over here is, how are we going to integrate all this information into one platform? So for which we need this artificial intelligence or the machine learning approaches. But we have like kind of a well-established machine learning approaches um, in terms of looking at supervised learning or unsupervised learning and all these big data analysis, how we can integrate everything together, develop an algorithm into one model, and that could be used for developing the personalized diet to prevent the development of cardiometabolic diseases in future. So on this note, I would like to thank all my genuine collaborators. And finally, uh, thank you so much for listening to my talk. In future, if you have any questions, please do drop me an email at v.karani at uh, reading.ac.uk. And thank you so much and happy to take any questions. Uh, Dr. Subha? Yeah. Sir, uh, the director had joined. Can we ask her to give her remarks quickly and then ask any questions if there are? Yeah. yeah. Dr. Ablata, please, Director Nain. Dr. Vimal Karni, I remember you five years back also, you gave a very fantastic talk. That is how I remember your second name, and I asked Subaru to contact you for this webinar. And Thank you. today Thank again, you, you didn't so fail I us. I was at the NIN. Yeah. yeah. That, um, today again, you didn't fail us. You gave a very, very good talk, and uh, you proved it right. I mean, it is nothing is much, uh, I mean, nothing much we can relate to genetics. It is all about lifestyle. Your lifestyle can change your genes and the phenotypes. So that was really excellent. Now let thank us you. take some questions from. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, ma'am. Uh, Professor Vimal, there is a question from uh, Dr. Banu Prakash. I'll allow him to talk and uh, give yeah, uh, sure. ask his question. Sure, please. Yeah, Dr. Banu, you can ask your question. Yeah, hi, uh, hi Professor Karani. Nice talk. Hello, Dr. Banu Prakash. So it's a trivial question. Whenever you say low genetic risk and high genetic risk with respect to two, three parameters, to start with the low protein, high protein, what was the low or high genetic risk? I was just curious to know that. Okay, thank you. That was a very interesting question. So, um, so when I use the term low genetic risk or moderate genetic risk and high genetic risk, of course, like I didn't give the explanation about the levels of genetic risk. So if you take any genetic variation, so we all carry like, two versions of that genetic variation. That is, 
either you carry two copies of the genetic variation for a particular SNP, or either you carry just one copy of the genetic variation and the other copy without the genetic variation, or the genetic variation that you're carrying, you might not carry any copies of the genetic variation. That is, both the copies are without the genetic variation. So when I say you carry two copies of the genetic variation, which means that you have a high genetic risk, and when I say you have just one copy of the genetic variation, it means that you have a moderate genetic risk. And when I say that you don't have any of the copies of the genetic variation, which refers to the fact that you belong to the low genetic risk. But like I'm just talking about one genetic variation over here, which is what we call as a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. But you have to understand that a human DNA has got nearly three to four million single nucleotide polymorphism. So just imagine like even if you might be carrying a low genetic risk, for a one particular SNP, you might be carrying a high genetic risk, that is the two copies for the remaining SNP. So when we carried out the study, we were not looking at just one SNP, we were looking at a panel of nearly 20 SNPs from the obesity genes, and we were creating a multiple uh, genetic risk score based on all the SNPs. So we were categorizing people into high genetic risk score and low genetic risk score and moderate genetic risk score based on the number of copies of the genetic variation. I hope I've yeah. answered that. Thanks. Now, if I get it, it's a panel of 20 obese genes. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. You have a question from your co-panelist, Dr. Sashikaran. Sir, you want to ask the question or you want me to read it out? No, you can read it out. No problem. Yeah. Uh, he asks, can we develop predictive metabolic fingerprints in infants? Is it possible? Well, it is, uh, well, theoretically it is possible, but in terms of practical practicality involved, we are still very far from in terms of uh, implementing that approach purely because of the fact that we still haven't discovered all the genetic variation. For example, if you look at obesity, we have discovered like nearly about 900 genes for obesity, but still these 900 genes are contributing only to 4% of the total variations in obesity, which means that the remaining 96% needs to be um, identified. And But having said that, in terms of looking at the epigenetic markers, some of the studies have clearly identified that certain epigenetic markers are contributing to nearly about 30% of the total variance in obesity variations as well. So taking on board with the epigenetics and the genetic markers, of course, it is possible, but it might not be showing a 100% prediction in terms of determining the development of the, the diseases. Thank you. Uh, th thank You're you, welcome. Professor Vimal. If you still have time before your next meet, I can. Can I ask uh, take one, one question here? Please, sure, sure. Please, please. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Another five, were, ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, just one question. You were uh, mentioning that B12 deficiency. We have to analyze and then uh, do the intervention. But uh, why not just intervene and give all the pregnant women in the five, uh, second trimester? Well, I mean, the, the first important point is uh, we still haven't confirmed that B12 deficiency is causing gestational diabetes. It's more of an hypothesis that I've developed. So I still do not know whether vitamin D deficiency is an important causative risk factor for gestational diabetes. So I need to confirm that because randomly we can't select our pregnant mothers and give them B12 supplementation. We need to have a kind of a, a valid confirmation that, okay, I'm going to prevent B12 deficiency. So I'm also preventing the development of gestational diabetes. So we are very much uh, in the beginning stage of this research at the moment. So we need to confirm that causal link and then move on to the B12 supplementation. Okay. And can you throw some more light on precision nutrition? I mean, personalized nutrition. I mean, do you think there will be large, huge variation from individual to individual in nutrition? Or do you think healthy uh, food that we advocate currently through a balanced diet, that should be good enough to satisfy the nutrient needs of most of the individuals? Do you think it is required to analyze genetically or each and every individual and come up with personalized, uh, personalized nutrition? Okay, it so is a very me... huge task and then yeah, definitely, definitely. resource very resource intensive as well. So. Exactly. So so let me put it this way. So for if you take the universal dietary recommendations like uh, uh, and uh, people have been following that like for the last uh, couple of decades and a lot of people like uh, consuming like this much portion of carbs, proteins and fats and five fruits a day. But you can see that despite following these universal dietary recommendations, uh, no, you don't agree with that? People are not following. That's the problem. But like even those who are following and doing regular exercises, you do get to hear the complaints that uh, I'm doing exercise, I'm consuming healthy food, but why am I gaining weight? 
Because my point is basically some people respond to that universal dietary recommendation, but some people are not responding because the, the so-called dietary recommendation vary from one person to another. There, there, you, there you can probably see some relation in a, a first thousand days nutrition and the impact of uh, uh, diet during pregnancy and the early infancy, probably, and also microbiome. But you, I don't think there is still scope to think that balanced diet also can go wrong. Well, you have given me the answer in terms of like taking into account of various other factors like gut mm, microbiome, early that's life. What? That's exactly what my message was like in terms of deep phenotyping. I'm not talking about just the genetic factors alone. You need to take into consideration of all the factors together. All the factors. Integration of these factors is what is required for implementing a personalized diet. Because a lot of gene testing centers are available in India. And they are all just looking at the genetic factors, but that alone is not sufficient enough to provide a personalized diet. So even now, like I'm not saying the personalized nutrition is going to be the future because like in 10 years down there, because 10 years ago, we didn't know much about the precision nutrition, but we are talking so much about precision nutrition today. But in 10 years down the lane, we don't know what the future is going to be. So there could be another uh, fancy term in relation to nutrition, which could be an approach to prevent the development of all these yeah. diseases. To some extent, what you say is true. See, for decades, we have seen people thriving on Mediterranean diet and also diets in Japanese who follow very healthy and balanced diet. They're all very healthy and their life expectancy is very good. But your situation, personalized nutrition, probably will great, uh, I mean, do wonders in special conditions like maybe celiac disease, maybe in special situations. That will be maybe about 2 to 3% of the population. I mean, I mean, that is my perception, probably. Yeah, I mean, I do agree with you to some extent uh, because we still do not have that evidence from all this information because as I said, the genetic markers, we still haven't discovered all the genetic markers we take for obesity or diabetes. But even this personalized concept, it's not only individualized, but it could also be applicable to a subset of the population, the people yeah, that's who belong what... to the high genetic risk. So, yes. Uh, but my perspective is like you cannot use one diet for the entire community of people or the entire population. Okay, you stick on to this diet and this is, a, this is what is called as a balanced diet. So um, that might not work for everyone. No, no, no. By and large, it will be same, but small variations will be there between individual to individual. But as you rightly pointed out, the small subset of the population probably will require this. Exactly. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really a wonderful talk and very informative. And uh, I mean, a lot of clarity came with respect to nutrigenomics. And One more last question, you. if you still have time. I'm, hey, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry ma'am. Uh, no Dr. Problem. Ayesha asks, does high genetic risk with regard to vitamin D deficiency indicate vitamin D receptor polyformisms only? Uh, uh, if you get that question straight, otherwise I'll ask uh, Dr. Ayesha to expand. No, no, I, I got the question. So it's not just based on the vitamin D receptor because a lot of uh, genetic studies focusing on vitamin D deficiency, they are focused only on the vitamin D receptor because, uh, uh, but like we have developed a kind of uh, genetic instrument for vitamin D deficiency. I can share the paper with you that we published it uh, about like seven, eight years ago. So it's basically a validation of the genetic instrument where we looked at all the markers relating to the vitamin D deficiency. So it's not just the vitamin D deficiency, all the genetic markers which are involved in regulating the synthesis and metabolism of 25 roxy vitamin D concentration. So we looked at nearly about uh, some 50 or 60 markers and we finalized with five or six genetic markers based on all the analysis and which will include all the CYP24A1 gene and VDR and GC binding protein and DHCR7. So all these genetic variations have been discovered through genome-wide association scans for vitamin D status. So it's not just a vitamin D receptor alone. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uday. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, one last question, uh, Dr. Karani. Uh, like my thought process, B12 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency are quite uh, rampant according to the popular studies in, uh, uh, in India and subcontinent, whatever it is. So in that context, directly supplementing them, like Dr. Uh, Hemlata was mentioning, uh, so uh, would it not have a, a potential good effect since anyway we know that quite a few people uh, most of them are deficient yeah that is true definitely but like why it has not been made so that's my question to you 
we are still waiting for a lot of evidence, right? Like from research activities. So that's what we are trying to do, I believe. So because without like having an underlying uh, evidence of like why, because we do, um, I mean, B12 deficiency and vitamin D deficiency is not mandatory at the moment, especially during pregnancy, right? So that is something, that is the whole point of the study that I was talking about, uh, B12 deficiency and GDM. The B12 screening and also the vitamin D deficiency screening has to be made as a mandatory protocol for all the pregnant mothers. But if I need to implement such policies, I need a very strong evidence from the intervention studies and large epidemiological studies. That's a good point. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Last, last question, please. Uh, layman's perspective, uh, as a media person, I ask you this question. Yeah, sure. Uh, are, uh, uh, you know, uh, precision nutrition and uh, general recommendation, that's a balanced diet for nutrition, complementary or should they look should they be looked at uh, as contradictory because you, you one of the slides that you projected talked about thousand days uh, nutrition and genetic predisposition nutrition played an important role although there is a genetic predisposition uh, so in that context is it contradictory uh, that you know you look at precision nutrition instead of balanced diets or you look at uh, both as complementary to each other well uh, as i said like the precision nutrition is could be like looked at in different ways. So some people say like I'm doing a precision nutrition approach and they don't even take into genetic factors on board. But like the precision nutrition is basically a holistic approach. It's not only taking into account of nutrigenetics or nutrigenomics or gut microbiome or epigenetics. You also need to take into account of your lifestyle, your dietary patterns, your socioeconomic status, and various social determinants, in addition to all the clinical and biochemical markers, like putting everything together. That is what I call as a precision nutrition. So how is the impact of a particular diet is having uh, uh, an effect on a, a person's uh, health outcome? So we need to look at it as a holistic approach rather than just looking at one or two factors. For example, some of my studies might have shown that um, a kind of like consuming low protein diet can overcome the genetic risk or reducing the intake of carbs might overcome the genetic risk. But that's actually a study which is like more uh, focusing on that particular community of people. But again, in those studies, I haven't looked at the gut microbiome or epigenetics. If I start incorporating all those factors into it, maybe I might not see any effect at all because those effects would have suppressed my main findings. So um so going back to the same fact that it's very much in an infant stage, I would say. No, but to Supa's question, I think it can be complementary yes. to balanced diet. Yes, definitely, definitely yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Any uh, other if, if there are uh, uh, no more questions, then I think uh, I profusely, from the bottom of my heart, I thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Vimal Karani. Uh, excellent lecture, like so many uh, people have put it in the chat and uh, so many opinions you have dealt starting from, like you, you have you have taught us at one level what is nutrigenomics, what is nutrigenetics and then omics. You are given a very big perspective with the B12 uh, situation uh, or the study being done currently by uh, your group. You touched on gut microbiome and pregnancy and childbirth. Finally, linked to cardiometabolic uh, disease. I mean, it was a very wholesome thing. You have give us, uh, given us a wholesome diet. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And um, once again, thank you uh, for responding in such a short time. And on behalf of uh, um, uh, the director and I, Dr. Hemlata, and uh, our own group, and uh, particularly, uh, I should also thank uh, Dr. Subarao for connecting you to us um, at a short notice. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vimal, and uh, we hope to have more interactions with you in the future. Yeah. Definitely. Thank definitely. you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very Thank much. You so Thank you so much. It was wonderful seeing some of the known faces again after a very long really, time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I'll take the opportunity to uh, just uh, say that when you are in South India next time, maybe you should come and give us a guest lecture uh, on yes. one of your yeah. <laughs> yeah, We'll take that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Yes, Subha. Uh, going ahead with the next part of the program, uh, sir, uh, you will take over to introduce Dr. S uh, Shashi. Yeah, yeah. Already known to all of us, but uh, <laughs> by the way yeah, of formality. Yeah. Nevertheless, to you must make that, yeah. yeah As a protocol, yeah, you yeah. must introduce. Protocol, us. yes. Yeah. No, uh, and it, and but it, there it, may be so some newcomers, some young people yeah, who do yeah, not yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. True. And several true. people watching uh, on YouTube. Yeah. 
So um, we come to the second part of our uh, webinar, uh, uh, where we have a lecture uh, by Dr. B. Shashikaran, former director of uh, this institute, ICMR uh, NIN, uh, who will be talking on uh, women, nutrition and health, micronutrients and food fortification. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it is uh, with respect to the conduct of the Potion Ma, which is going on in the month of September. And uh, before uh, I invite Dr. Shishikaran to uh, give his uh, talk, a brief uh, 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 few words about him. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be uh, uh, to have worked under him, with him uh, for almost two decades. Uh, and then, um, so Dr. Sheshikaran Boindla is a former director of NIN Hyderabad. He's a pathologist by training and qualification and has carried out research in the area of nutrition, food safety and toxicology for about three decades. He was director of NIN between 2006 and 2012. And then he's the past president of Nutrition Society of India. He was a member of Biosimilar Drugs, RDS, and Dietary Guidelines. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences and fellow of International Medical Scientists Academy, as well as AP and Telangana Academy of Sciences. Member is a member of the governing body of Nutrition Foundation of India and member scientific advisory committee Gut Microbiota and Probiotic Science Foundation India. He is also the chairman for the scientific advisory committee of Protein Foods and Nutrition Development Association of India. There is still a, a bigger list, but I will stop here and then I would invite uh, Dr. Shashikaran to give his lecture, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you Ulai, for uh, the kind introduction and uh, thank you Dr. Hemalata and uh, Subarao and all of you from NIN for giving me an opportunity to speak to you all. It's been a long time since I ever participated in any NIN seminar and I still miss the feeling of going on stage on the, in the assembly hall. It's been now <laughs> almost three, four years. So anyway, this is a uh, a slightly a better alternative than nothing at all. So let me uh, first uh, share the screen. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay. Now the topic I had uh, chosen was uh, Considering that this was a seminar which was supposed to have been uh, women-centric and also relation to the nutrition month, which is almost coming to an end. And also in relation to the present discussions which are going on on micronutrient fortification and so on. I've actually used only the data from national surveys and data from publications that came from uh, NIN to base my talk. Now, if the one of the sur one recent surveys we have had in India is the Comprehensive National Nutrition Survey, which took place between 2016 and 18. So let's look at what the data shows. And from this, this is only on children and up to adolescents. And among these, I will be focusing only on the female adolescents. Now you see the triple burden of disease in this graph shown so elegantly is that on to the left, you have burden number one, which is under nutrition. The marker for that is the prevalence of stunting. There are about 46 million children under five years who are stunted. And on to the extreme right, we have burden number three, which is anemia, which is the marker for micronutrient deficiencies in our country. It's a huge problem. Around 447 million people in this country have got anemia. And in between these two is the second burden, which is the one of NCDs. And you see that 72 million people are diabetic. About 166 million are overweight and obese. Now, the 
if you look at the percentage of stunting and the low bmi among children and adolescents you look at the solid red line and you find that as the age advances the stunting keeps on going up and then almost reaches a peak somewhere the maximum amount of prevalence is between the age of 10 to 12 years i mean uh, a low bmi between 10 to 12 years and then on it sort of improves among the female adolescents but what is relevant to this slide is that between the 10 to 13 when their bmis are pretty low many of these girls actually get married and they also conceive and that is a dangerous situation on the other hand if you look at the percentage of overweight uh, adolescent girls look at the purple dark line it's not really that much here in fact both view and the waist circumference around six to eight percent are uh, overweight among the adolescent girls now we come to the problem of anemia anemia has got many causes and has got many effects and i will not go into this because you are all fully aware but will it is because of low iron intake it because of a poor micronutrient diet and many other factors including the onset of uh, menstruation among these girls now what is important is if you look on to the right of the center circle there's one circle is saying reduced educational achievement one of the side effects is the reduced educational achievement. In fact, I remember there have been studies from NIN itself, we showed that anemic children are less attentive and they are poor in scholastic performance. So you can imagine if a girl is not performing well in school, not because she is less intelligent, but because she's anemic and it is undiscovered. The next thing that the family will do is anyway, you are not doing well in school. So let us get you married. So you see the long-term implications, the social implications and anemia in a girl are likely to happen. So the key findings of the CNNS survey was, you look at only the red triangles highlighting the data is, the prevalence of anemia among female adolescents is 40%. And almost 20 states in our country are affected by this. And 31% out of this 40% is because of iron deficiency. And so providing iron is indeed a good solution. And you also realize that the adolescents are more anemic adolescents are seen in urban areas than in the rural areas. Now you look at the prevalence of anemia, we are right from one year onwards towards adolescent again you concentrate on the dark uh, red line whereas the dotted red one is for uh, males you find that the anemia prevalence keeps on actually coming down till the age of about 10 or 11 and then starts shooting up and this is obviously because of increased blood loss with the onset of uh, menstruation in these girls there is also a myth that anemia is more, it is a problem of the poorer people and not for the others, which is not true. You look at the pink line in the graph, 33.5% is the prevalence of anemia among the poorest families compared to 23% in the richest family. So anemia is definitely less, but it is present. But what is more important is almost 30% of the adolescent girls in middle income, which is the largest chunk in our country, are also anemic. So anemia is a problem which affects all segments of the socioeconomic strata. <coughs> and therefore, any kind of intervention is not tar cannot be targeted against any one particular group. Now let's look at the percentage of adolescents who are vitamin A, D, or zinc deficient. Almost 15% are vitamin D deficient among women, uh, adolescent girls, 34% are vitamin D deficient, and 28% are zinc deficient, according to the survey. So, what is the combined importance of these deficiencies? All these nutrients are involved in immune function. So, you can imagine if these children's immune function is low and they are going to later on 
conceive and have children. So what is likely to be the long-term consequences and therefore these deficiencies also need to be rectified. Then we, we are discussing about B12 and folate among adolescents. 27% of the adolescent girls are deficient in B12 and 34% with folate deficiency. Not only are these nutrients associated with the hemoglobin synthesis, but as was discussed by Vimal, this all greatly involves the genetic programming and it could lead to altered metabolism in the offspring and cause adverse body composition and is a very, therefore a very critical nutrient to replace or provide. Iodized salt has been there in our country for quite some time, but even then almost 5% of the adolescent girls have low urinary iodine. And we know that if such girls were to conceive, the fetus is probably at high risk of having a mental, the retarded mental development. We then look at the issue of NCDs. What, what is the, what percentage of uh, the female adolescents uh, have these pre-diabetic conditions? All this almost 10%. And uh, this is another problem which is uh, baffling us is so why is it that these girls who also have low BMI, but at the same time are having features of uh, uh, pre-diabetes. And then you look at the lipid profiles. Fortunately, the CNNS has actually done the biochemical tests in all this uh, test population. And I was surprised to find that 25% of the adolescent girls have low HDL cholesterol. And we know that HDL is not related to the fat intake, but is related more to the physical activity. It is quite likely that these girls have already become physically less active at that adolescent age itself. Then another worrying factor is that almost 5% of the girls and 8% of the boys in the adolescent age group had high serum creatinine. We do not know. I know that uh, my friend uh, Harlapa has been doing some study on chronic kidney disease. We need to look into that in depth as to why serum creatinine levels are high and do we have that kind of a problem in other parts of the country as well. One thing probably can be correlated with the high serum creatinine is the early onset of high blood pressure. And we find that that again is almost 5% in each of these uh, genders. So is there any relationship between this high serum creatinine and the onset of high blood pressure early in the day? Now coming to pregnancy in adolescents, as I mentioned earlier, this is a major risk factor both for the mother and the child, and this has to be avoided at all costs. So about 5% of the adolescent girls in urban areas become pregnant by the time they are 19 years old, and it's almost double that in the rural areas. Now we move on from CNNS to data on NFHS, which covers the entire adult population. We'll look at the adult women with anemia, compare within the red circle, uh, below the large red circle compares NFHS3 and NFHS4 in terms of anemia prevalence in non-pregnant, pregnant and all women. There's hardly any difference between three and four, which means in 10 years, Nothing has changed in the prevalence of anemia in our country. You again go to the top panel of this graph, you find that women whose BMIs are below 18.5, they were 36% in NFHS3 and they have come down to 23%, which is a good sign. So the number of undernourished women seem to have come down in the last 10 years. But you look at the third line from the top, which shows the number of women whose BMI is greater than 25, it is 12.6% in NFHS3 and it is 20.6. It's already gone up eight percentage points in 10 years. So here we have a good news on top and a not so good news at the lower panel. The blood sugar levels and the blood pressure levels are also seen in this, pop, uh, in this NFHS4 uh, and is not there in NFHS3. So we don't have any comparators. So there is a 10% of uh, impaired glucose tolerance and uh, uh, frank diabetes in uh, women uh, between 15 to 50 years of age. And as shown earlier, there's a 
influence of high blood pressure also and some of our uh, surveys done by dr lakshmaya and his colleagues have shown that as high as 20 even 30 percent in some of the states so blood pressure blood sugar under nutrition all are big challenges for us now the unicef has made some uh, has, has given some essential nutrient interventions which are relevant to solving this problem among women is to improve mother's food intake in quality and quantity to be done through PDS, ICDS, and also through knowledge, attitude, and practices. And this is what uh, where fortification also comes to play. Then address micronutrient deficiency and anemia through supplements, staple fortification, pre- and periconception folic acid. All these are there in our government uh, programs. Provide calcium and vitamin A supplements and provide women's access to basic nutrition and health services and pregnancy monitoring, which is also being done under portion of young. Other essential factors which need to be improved to improve nutrient, but not directly related to nutrition are water, sanitation, and hygiene, empowerment of women, marriage only after 18 years, and delay the first pregnancy and reduce the interval between pregnancies. And there should be community support for skill development and empowerment of women in the community. And this is an important aspect which has direct, indirect implications on the nutritional status. The National Nutrition Mission or the Portion Abhyan, as it is called now, had the, has the following targets bring down low birth weight at the rate of 2% every year between 17 to 22. Reduce the stunting prevalence to 25% by the year 22. Reduce child underweight every year by 2%. And reduce anemia prevalence by 3% every year between 2017 to 12 in children under 5 and women 15 to 49. How we are going to achieve these targets? I really don't know, but fortification at least is one of the possible answers. The targets set by WHO and UNICEF for the year 2030, they, all, they keep on having this goalpost being shifted uh, because uh, many countries do not really achieve whatever is the goal, is uh, bringing down low birth weight to 30% uh, 30 reduction in prevalence of birth weight by 2030. Uh, exclusive breastfeeding first six months to 70%. Anemia, a 50% reduction in anemia in women by 2030. And also child underweight uh, by, by 3%, less by 3% at 2030. I'm sorry. Okay, we now come to the second part is that food fortification with micronutrients. There's been a lot of discussion on this. Is it the best solution? The answer is no. The best solution is to provide food, a wide variety of food, diverse food, lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of whole, whole grains, legumes, etc. But is it, is it possible right now? During the COVID pandemic, there was enough information to show that people lost their jobs, lost their incomes, and their existing food intakes also came down drastically. Immediately, this is not possible, but this should be our ultimate goal or aim. And will it be, will fort fortification be an immediate solution? Answer is definitely yes. It can be done right away and it is being done. Will it be effective? Yes. The reason why we say fortification is effective is because the world over we have seen fortification being effective. Why are we different? I will come to that slide later on. Is it cost effective? Absolutely cost effective. World Bank said 10, 15 years back that providing iron and iron fortification is one of the best commercial investments can be for every one rupee, a million rupees you'll get out in terms of benefit. Will it cause any harm? There's absolutely no evidence. And I'll also come to that as to why do we say that there is no evidence of any harm? So why this focus on hunger and malnutrition? Hunger, malnutrition causes a whole lot of disabilities and a huge economic burden 
you see, and there also is a huge social burden. In fact, we have children dropping out of school. They again go back and do child labor or whatever it is, and some of them may even become antisocial. We do not know what happens in the long run. So malnutrition, malnutrition, as we know, starts quite early, right in the womb. So we have to stop that. Micronutrient malnutrition impacts health and survival, learning ability and education capability, school performance and retention rate, disability, economic productivity. All these are irreversible, but all these are preventable. So let us prevent it first. Now coming to the diets, a typical Indian diet is predominantly with carbohydrate, which is a small percentage of vegetable fruits and all other things which are capable of giving us the micronutrients. So whereas the kind of a balanced plate we are recommending is this, we should achieve this. There's, like, there's no second thought about that. But can we do this tomorrow? We can't. But we can certainly do fortify and at least mitigate the long-term problems in the people. So the, there are three strategies to control micronutrient malnutrition. One, of course, is supplementation. The problem is this effective, its ability to reach is a problem. It reaches only 55% and compliance is an issue. Dietary diversification, affordability of a diversified diet is again a big question. So that leaves us only with stable food fortification where you, it is like saying you can have the cake and eat it too. So the people can be given the micronutrient through whatever they are eating. Now, understanding food fortification, fortification is enrichment in the process of adding vitamins and minerals to food, especially staples like wheat flour, oil, milk, etc. is considered to be a good public health policy. Fortification also be purely a commercial choice also in the sense that even the commercial food industry can add fortificants, but the, now the, as per food safety regulation, many of these where large doses of vitamins are I mean, added, go under foods for special dietary uses or foods for special medical purpose category. The strategic advantages of fortification that staple foods are consumed regularly. So we know all this. It is proven simple and a low cost technology unless we try to complicate it further. It's a preventive population-wide approach. It can cover every segment of the population, right from children to the elderly through the various channels. Staple foods are centrally processed. The risk of excessive intake of nutrients is very is hardly any. There will be no change in color, texture, etc. These are what uh, we do even before the food goes into the market. And it's also highly bioavailable and it can cause rapid impact without requiring any behavioral change. And micronutrients are also stable during cooking. Now, food fortification is not a new idea. You can see that in 1918, it was done in Canada with vitamin D. In 1923, 33, all across the world, you have seen food fortification being done. Did they have any? kind of an adverse event recorded so far? No, but we what, what is it now? We are talking about uh, adverse event. Now, toxicity, unfortunately, is a word which is highly misused, misunderstood. I spent all my life trying to convince people in meeting, don't talk about toxicity. Toxicity or efficacy is only a matter of dosage. And you look here that if iron, for example, an EAR is 15 milligrams per day, tolerable upper limit is 45. Now, let you something about tolerable upper limit. Tolerable upper limit is not a harmful limit. It is the highest amount of nutrients that an individual can take for all his life and not have any toxicity. The toxicity level is actually called as a lowest adverse effect level is at least 10 times higher than the tolerable upper limit. So even if I were to touch tolerable upper limit, still there will not be any adverse event that, that is another 10 times higher, which is unlikely to happen. Now, if you calculate the estimated average requirement, which an individual is already taking and also taking a fortified rice, fortified wheat at a rate of 250 grams per person per day, 
she will be getting 20 milligrams of iron now in terms of percent rda it will be around 70% of rda she will get through these fortified foods all of them put together along with what she is getting through a natural course and percentage of tolerable upper limit it will all it's still 50% below the tolerable upper limit and toler harmful effect is 10 times more than tolerable upper limit so this is an understanding which people should have now the same exercise you do with uh, uh, this is with iron yes this is, and it is around 36% uh, percent of the uh, tolerable upper limit for men and 45% at the maximum through iron fortified wheat flour vitamin d it will be around 111 percent of the rda so there's nothing to worry about and when it come to percent of tolerable upper limit is only 16 percent so where is the question of getting worried about uh, toxicity so vitamin a similarly with all the fortification it will be 95 percent or 86 percent of rda which is only 26% of tolerable limit and 28% of tolerable limit. And it is way, way below any concern for toxicity. Now, coming to cost of fortification, there is no burden to the government, nothing significant. It's going to cost only 8 rupees per person per day to 40, for 45 per, per year for wheat flour, 3 rupees per person per year for milk, and three rupees per person for edible oil. So you can imagine if fortification is going to successfully reach how much of economic benefit we will get out of all the other uh, healthy situation the people will be in. Does fortification work? Yes, in Canada, vitamin A deficiency was brought down from 48% to 2% by fortification. In Venezuela, iron deficiency in just two years came down from 37% to 15 percent. So it works. Now let us look at one example in India. Rajasthan for it, is not a very good state in terms of our nutrition, uh, nutrient indicators. If you look at this all India underweight stunting and all is on 36, 38 and 50. In Rajasthan it is 37, 39 and 51. So nothing to be, it is as pretty bad. Vitamin A uh, vitamin A injections, at least one dose, what person receive on the country, only 60%. In Rajasthan, it is much worse, only 40% get the vitamin A. Mothers taking iron folate tablets is only 30% in India, is only 17% in Rajasthan. But with just two years of wheat flour fortification, the prevalence came down. Vitamin A deficiency, all India is 21.5. It was came down to 1 or 1.9. Okay, this is two age groups in uh, 5 to 19 and 10 to 19. So it, you see how much it, effect it had. Now the same in even though the iron folic acid uh, is low intake in terms of tablet for pregnant women, you see the national prevalence of uh, anemia among pregnant women and all women 50, 53. It came down to 46 and 46.8. All this is because they introduced fortified wheat flour in public distribution system during 2012 to 14. They were able to bring this down. Now, what are the channels for fortification? You know all this. It can go through ICDS, through the midday meal, the public distribution, and even through the open market. So it will cover all segments of the society. I'll now quote one study which was published by. Uh, Ramesh, Vishnu, and Madhavan Nair. This is our own study. That's the impact of iron fortified foods on hemoglobin concentration in children under 10 years. This is a systematic review and meta analysis of randomized control trials published in 2013. They chose 18 studies, 5,000 and odd participants, and they found that iron fortified foods could be an effective strategy for reducing iron deficiency anemia. I'm quoting our own studies. And another study, which was systematic review and meta-analysis approach on vitamin A fortified and its effect on retinol concentration in children under 10. This is by again Vishnu's paper. Dr. Nair is also there. Published in 2019. And this study, the consumption of vitamin A fortified foods results in increased concentration of retinol and thereby results in reduction of vitamin A deficiency. Remember, all these calculations are based on percent RDA. We are not talking about EAR. 
talking about eir is like shifting the goal post you can't score a goal at when the goal is at the rda level bring it closer to eir i don't think this makes sense eir is a value which is okay for 50% of the population there's another 50% for whom it is not adequate and rda is the recommended dietary allowance so let us stick to the rda and the rich returns on low investment part fortification is a great potential to enrich food and livelihood which i have been repeatedly stating so let us not miss the opportunity so now we come to the last part of my talk which is on covid because the title of your seminar also mentions covid 19 so what was the impact of covid 19 on women's health their access to health care was difficult there are many a pregnant woman could probably not reach the hospital even in urban areas it was a challenge so it, the, there could be a possible impact on the maternal and child morbidity and mortality a dutch famine like impact could have happened many of you are familiar that in 1945 there was a famine in holland and before that everything is okay after that everything is okay so people followed up all the concept uh, conceived babies who were born during that particular period and they found 50 years later their cardiovascular morbidity was much much higher than babies who were conceived before that famine year or after so maybe 30 40 years from now we should constantly be looking at what was the impact of this covid period on infant and maternal status in the long term and in covid women 80% of the nurses and midwives were women and they were the leading covid warriors who helped protect many lives and we have in addition of course about 30% of the women tend to be our doctors and uh, they are quite quite likely that many of them actually got the disease and some of them might have even succumb now coming to job losses we are all aware that rural rural migrant labor uh, lost their jobs and therefore their nutritional status must have uh, fallen down from what it was and 80% of those migrant labor who lost their jobs were women and so you can see what kind of impact it might have had and among the women who were in the within the homes all this period it was shown that their housework went up by 30% leave alone the psychological impact that is not being i am not talking about that the housework levels went up what are the incidence of covid 19 in women right now all over incidence more than 33 million people got covid in our country surprisingly 70% are men only 30% were women so why were women less probably because they were less exposed probably because they were more careful more disciplined and they were very well managing themselves because they knew that if something happens to them the whole family is going to suffer so and therefore by god's grace the number of women affected were less coming to fatalities with comorbidities and without comorbidities it is around 18% chances of dying if we have a comorbidity whereas it's only 1.2% if we do not have a uh, comorbidity so what needs to be done for the women they need nutrition security they need health care access independence and social security equal access to work and pay i think in india quite a few women actually get equal pay independent of their gender but you will be surprised that in united states even now women are fighting for equal pay compared to men a very advanced country still doesn't pay their women equally and they need access to uninterrupted education if you want to change the nutritional status of families we have to educate the women and this we have been saying for many many years so let me now uh, conclude by quoting rabindranath tagore's poetry slightly changed to in tune for women where the minds of women is without fear and the head is held high where knowledge and nutrition is freely accessible where the clear stream of reason and equality has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom my father let my country's women awake thank you thank you very much sir thank and you, sir. Uh, that was a time. very great talk keep the time yeah uh, as usual you have been a very very lucid in your presentation and uh, 
and then but you presented a lot of data sir that was really nice yeah you covered the entire uh, spectrum starting yeah. from uh, childhood to you can uh, you can keep my slides thank you sir thank uh, you very thank much you, sir. if you can give your slides that yeah, yeah my pleasure yeah. after all what do i use it for sir uh, one thing is uh, being uh, portion ma uh, i mean uh, i i'll uh, just a uh, couple of observations i made during a presentation sir if i can uh, just uh, bring it out you had focused more on women uh, very good but to my surprise i found that with respect to vitamin d vitamin a zinc actually you didn't say but then it's more in boys as compared to girls in the adolescent group sir and b12 deficiency folate and pre diabetes i mean uh, both the sexes are getting affected in this particular age group absolutely uh, but so, women we are more concerned because they are ultimately going to become pregnant that's the whole issue true 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 sir true <laughs> But then uh, it's a revelation that we need to consider the boys also. Yes, that's why fortification will cover everybody, both genders, all age groups. In fact, elderly we have not touched at all. There's a huge yeah. problem of elderly also. True, true. Uh, geriatric group, yes, sir. So, so uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, these are a, a couple of observations. I thought I thought I should share with the uh, with everybody. Yeah, Dr. Ablada, please. yeah they your observation is right very keen observation indeed like i would tell just like how less number of women less, uh, had covid compared to men similarly nature probably tries to save the women uh, gender and uh, even with little nutrition probably they are coping up and they maintain the levels that are required so always when you compare with men women fare better the reason could be probably because they transmit that across generations so they have the kind of beautiful adaptation to the situation and they always fare better compared to men i mean saving the lives across generations the first agenda of nature so they are I actually the stronger to... sex we call them the, the weaker sex. sex which is not not which right they are wrong. The yes. stronger sex life expectancy also is more they get the uh, uh, infection less frequently and their mortality rate also is much lesser compared to even with covid so coming to your presentation this um, i agree with you that fortification with respect to folic acid neural tube defects iodine goiter then uh, cretinism and also vitamin c supplements and then many other uh, i mean we really had lots of achievements globally as well as in india but with respect to iron i feel strongly that the story is slightly different because uh, With respect to iron and anemia, not just iron, there are many other nutrients that are required. We keep on supplementing iron. Will they synthesize hemoglobin if they need other nutrients like folic acid, vitamin B12, and then vitamin C and zinc, which are all which also impact the iron metabolism, and also certain amino acids which are required. So unless they achieve wholesome diet, is it possible to improve hemoglobin status just with iron fortification? Yeah, in fact, it is even people with having wholesome diet are still not able to meet their iron requirements. So we are now talking about providing iron to across the various strata. Those who are getting wholesome nutrition, those who are not getting wholesome nutrition, also there is a need to actually promote as according to our guidelines, a wholesome kind of a diet which provides all the other nutrients. and iron despite that iron is very little coming from our food so provide iron advise wholesome nutrition and you will be able to achieve better iron but when we calculated the iron iron intake through a balanced diet say for instance our my plate and other balanced diet they are nicely meeting iron is not at all a problem the problem is only really major yeah majorly with b12 riboflavin how many people how often are eating balanced diet is always a big question mark that is so it is our our exercise so if, on if a, paper is not translated yeah, if a person is taking balanced diet then i don't think yeah, they require no, issue. no yeah. issue and another thing i would like to tell there are two very interesting studies from ni one is by dr radhika which the study shows under supervised feeding the fortified rice yes indeed it has improved iron and also hemoglobin but the group that did not receive iron fortification just by supervised feeding of the icbs diet itself they have improved agreed. hemoglobin agreed you can we do supervised feeding continuously for all the 1 1 billion population in our country is it possible 
the second the second the second finding is sir from uh, the cnns data dr bharati and team they have analyzed the data and uh, published it in i think british journal of nutrition here it uh, very i mean it is a paradoxical finding in the poor people in the rural children the iron levels are better but they are more anemic whereas in the urban children the iron level is lower but their hemoglobin is better yes. i mean what about for what have you measured other, yeah. for want no I, apparently i would say for want of other nutrients the poor rural children are unable to synthesize hemoglobin and their anemia they have more anemia even though there is iron in the serum whereas what in about, urban what about children parasitic what parasitic infections no, the here the serum, i'm talking about the serum iron levels the serum iron levels are there but they are anemic still anemic probably because of want of uh, due to want other of other nutrients. nutrients correct agree and another third point i would like to tell sir we, when we have did modeling studies and all it clearly shows even if you promote the double fortified salt that is very much in place and also tested and population studies are also there that itself is enough to prevent any i mean to control anemia whereas double fortified salt is not consumed only two or two or three percent of the population is getting double fortified salt and uh, i mean before uh, emphasizing more on improving the uptake of double fortified salt that to uh, which has been tested in nim which uh, the technology has been developed by nim in collaboration with other group instead of doing that are we right in moving on to the rice fortification stay double fort see we have multiple sources are required okay when you have the penetration if you have the penetration of double fortified salt in the same manner as cereals across the country salt alone probably we saw see originally when bsn and others were thought was salt is the cheapest everybody uses salt even people don't have money to buy rice will have money to buy salt so all those factors were taken and salt is still now is the best vehicle there's no denying that but we have had lot of standardization effect quality of salt so you need a very high quality of salt a higher quality of salt is shooting up the price of the salt people are then therefore complaining saying that why should a poor man pay 20 rupees for a packet of salt when he can get the same thing for 2 rupees or 5 rupees see all these operational issues are coming up in terms of salt and salt also was subjected to right when you see when i was there i and dr prema went up to the prime minister and got the whole thing cleared so what happened in 10 12 years nothing has happened even tatas who are making double fortified salt now this is not there in the market so obviously there is there is a big issue of promoting the particular salt the government takes salt fortification also as a primary goal along with uh, cereal fortification over a period of time you can remove cereal fortification and stay only with salt fortification salt, salt fortification is not taken yeah, because the tata group tata group is still is trying on salt fortification in the, in fact they are taking technological help from uh, uh, our group only ragu's group and the other team also is working with them uh, uh, even though they are working so hard it is not the quality of what uh, i mean it doesn't match the quality that has been produced by ni still but some of we are not marketing it and government also is i mean uh, if you ask radhika and so many com- companies have entered into mou and so many companies were promoting uh, producing this double fortified salt now it is slowly coming down even after repeatedly requesting them the um, wcd departments of various state governments are also not promoting and the industries also have stopped producing it because the tata is trying to dominate and they want to produce uh, fortified salt and they want to capture that market probably and this is another issue you iodized salt now there's a lot of lobbying to stop universal iodization no so that's that salt is a very sensitive issue because of various other political factors but iodized so salt uptake is quite good let us try studies have shown 70% 90% uptakes yeah let us try various uh, methods and see which one is acceptable and another which one is... another thing sir um i mean the single nutrient supplementation see uh, there are so many nutrients in the food macro micronutrients and there are so many unknown nutrients also 
in a cohort study that we had done in Adagutta area, when we have supplemented one single nutrient, that is zinc supplementation, when children had calorie gap, the children who were supplemented with this single nutrient without addressing the calorie gap, only counseling was given to them, they developed adiposity. And the children who had calorie gap and who were not supplemented with the single nutrient, they did not develop adiposity. So there could be some complications if we resort to single nutrient supplementation without addressing the whole dietary diversity issues, calorie inadequacy issues, and and uh, wholesome diet as well. Yeah. So your remarks like, on this. Like, see, I tell you, see, we have to have a post-marketing mechanism even with fortification. It's not that you let fortification, let loose, and then don't bother about it for next 10 years. No. That's true. Like, like we do in drug, drugs, we have a continuous phase for post-marketing where our NIN should, I, I wish we had the NNMB, we could monitor it. See, fortification yes. is not an irretrievable, see, in the meantime, we are also getting biofortified crops. If once you have biofortified crops, you can cut down on this uh, chemical fortification already. You can withdraw chemical fortification, replace with biofortified salt. We can have a long term strategy, but today, do I have a better strategy? The answer is no. I'm resorting to a suboptimal strategy simply because I don't have a better strategy. And we can't let more and more people suffer because of their micronutrient deficiency and become literally disabled in our country and our country's economy can't go to the dogs just because of nutrition. So let us have a long-term plan for about the next 10 to 20 years on how you will monitor, what will be a mid-course correction, how you will bring in biofortified crops as and when they come in, and how will you ultimately achieve everybody has access to all the foods which are required for a balanced diet. So that kind of a plan we have to form. Last, uh, last remarks, uh, this is not a question. With respect to biofortified uh, crops, I mean, uh, some uh, few weeks back, I attended one conference where farmers also were there and farm, farm, I mean, agriculture experts also were there. They say there are natural, I mean, crops which are naturally very rich with iron and zinc. So instead of promoting those natural varieties, why uh, uh, why do we promote industries which I mean industries and companies which go for this biofortified? Uh, I'll tell you why. I'll I tell mean, you the answer. Nat natural land races, what they are called, very rich in micronutrient. We have got uh, uh, red rice in Kerala and Navara rice in another place. There are a variety of rice varieties, variety of wheat varieties, very rich in nutrients. The biggest drawback with these high nutrient ones are soil fertility and also the yield. So if yield you don't the address low. these, the yield is low. When the yield is low, the income is low for the farmer, so he doesn't take it up. So what they are now trying to do is take the genetic material from the soil by crossbreeding with high yielding varieties, you can produce a high yielding nutrition rich varieties. And that is what we mean by biofortified crops. So you cross them with the present uh, high yield with the high nutrient one and you will get a hybrid. Use the hybrids. Okay, thank, you, sir. thank you very much. Uh, if uh, you still have time, I'll take two or three questions from the audience. I know. Yeah, yeah sir. Uh, Sylvia asks, will fortification be, an, uh, be a hindrance or uh, it will cause delay in our long-term goals of achieving diet diversity or balanced meals, can we have a roadmap or a timeline uh, to put in place? Yeah, I think just now I answered that question about the long-term plan. Yeah, yeah. Exactly true. See, the things that fortification, once you do fortify and things get better, they will get better. We should not be showing, trying Listen. on the rooftop saying that we have solved microbiota. No, it is only a stopgap arrangement. All countries, as I showed Canada, et cetera, et cetera, have finally gone into food-based approach. It's only for that period they use fortification. So we cannot so, uh, give so up our on comment our... That it, yeah. So our comment that it is a temporary measure is correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when, when uh, Dr. Kurpad raised this yesterday, uh, he was talking about the huge investments that the industry has to make and the country has to make to fortify foods. And if they were to be withdrawn, say, in about five years or 10 years, 
uh, for the uh, you know uh, as we get along but with that tomorrow, also, but, but tomorrow waste. the gains that we get, get in terms of health and all the investment that is made is not much and industry yeah. also you know subarav is not a static entity the yeah. products of today in industry are not there 5 years later they are constantly changing their infrastructure so they are quite okay if tomorrow you dump fortification they will redeploy the whole thing to do something else so industry we don't have to worry we don't have to yeah. guarantee the industry anything they should be able to take it so see these are all small operational issues which should not come in the larger picture yeah by way of debate i was just raising this yeah, yeah. question yeah dr take, banu take says uh, banu sir, yeah yeah dr banu says utility or absorption is a bigger issue than meeting just the requirement what is your comment on that utility and absorption, absorption are more important utility of the nutrient or absorption of the nutrient are very important than just merely meeting the requirement absolutely at see at the moment your data shows that in an anemic woman you give iron fortified food or iron as such her hemoglobin improves okay so that means her absorption her utility part of the metabolism is functional and what is missing is the requirement and the requirements are being given only to at rda levels as sub rda levels so which is normally what is recommended for the day to day intake so you are only replacing that when you give mega doses how it will get utilized how will the unutilized one will take place all those issues come in but when you are giving an rda doses if the person has got the basic mechanism of absorption which most human beings have that should get absorbed unless there's an infection or a health issue uh dr banu you want to uh, elaborate or rebut that or no, no, should no, i go no, to the next fine. question that's fine no i'll yeah. just i wanted to add on to that uh, point on sure. uh, wholesome foods well uh, we'll ignore the wholesome foods but in, in a small uh, study where we had 300 uh, adults it is not wholesome foods but their uh, requirement of iron was 80% adequacy was 80% but still they were anemic so that's a con- yeah. that's a context i am saying about the utility no if a it person is not either. responding if a person is not responding to oral intake of iron if they got still anemic you should go down to the depth of that particular uh, individuals and find out why yeah. they were not responding it's quite likely that there will be some other problem so we are only Absolutely. giving it up saying that iron is not working it's not that iron is not working there is something wrong in the metabolism of those people let look into that absolutely sir in the same context we have to also think about whether we should dump some more iron or not yeah i mean i don't oh, extend that no more iron only as as much iron as a part of an rda you are not dumping iron <laughs> you are giving <laughs> them the missing <laughs> giving iron you are giving them sir, the yeah. missing iron you are not yeah. dumping iron dumping sir, iron yes will be a problem you are giving the missing iron yes sir i'll extend that question with uh, ragu's point uh, dr ragu asks in this endeavor are we ending up penalizing men with multiple foods fortified with iron <laughs> see you may fortify 100 different foods but on any single day you eat only five types of food remember that multiple foods fortification does not mean a human being is going to eat all the foods on a single time meal he can eat only 5 or 6 so it is like it is like an auto regulation in the body will take care of that uh, can i add a point here uh, like yeah. yesterday also is mentioning sir that uh, it is not the question of uh, availability it is the question of affordability also yes Yes. so uh, being dumped with micronutrients from multiple sources may not happen like you mentioned that i uh, how many people can really afford uh, if what with fortification obviously the price will go up and then you will actually uh, tailor your this uh, your uh, your buying based on what you have so affordability is also issue which most of the times we miss it and perhaps uh, the the difference between tuls and toxicity is also one important thing that you raised that needs to be yeah and there yeah, is also is a problem uh, i have been trying to explain this for 30 years and nobody understands everybody said tul is toxicity so don't go near tul tul is not toxic level lowest adverse effect level and in fact we should 
get rid of to word toxicity and say adverse effect are there any adverse effect don't adverse say effects. are there any toxic effect toxic is a synonymous with poisonous okay so once you say toxic then the whole media gets um, sort of okay. uh, hyped up on that and it defeats yeah. all our media gets intentions. delirious yeah yeah they get delirious <laughs> so in fact in fact we coined the term hypervitaminosis right uh, i mean rather than think hypervitaminosis is the word that's that co commonly comes up but somehow yeah, again with, with vitamin a fortification some studies are there that it reduces bone density sir vitamin a fortification it has uh, mm -hmm. shown in some subgroups of population that it reduces bone density and causes not toxicity but adverse effects bone density. yeah yeah we should know the mechanism of of course vitamin k is supposed to increase bone density so there must be other interact interaction sir, sir one last point by ragu again he says fortified foods reduce iron deficiency anemia uh, but not anemia what's your comment no. no i agree on that you find that 40% of the adolescent women were anemic of which 31% was iron deficiency anemia so we are addressing that 31% the remaining 9% we are not addressing so among the uh, anemic people there are many for whom it is not iron deficiency 50% so they are unlikely to be anemic yeah. so 50% of the anemic people is not due to not due to iron, iron deficiency iron. absolutely right yeah sir one more question i think we uh, you you answered and also director ma'am but i'll just extend that uh, can we make fortification in mid day meal schemes uh, in every state will this be beneficial to lower socio economic group especially i think it is in the context of them not getting other uh, required nutrients to uh, use iron uh, effectively to uh, convert into hemoglobin i think that's See, the right question. now the fortification includes iron folic acid b12 as a package right so vitamin c needs to be added to the whole thing and it will improve the bio uh, iron bioavailability so when you are introducing through midday meal scheme midday meal is actually a meal they are also getting other micronutrients through the vegetables etc which is coming through midday meal only rice is not given only wheat is not given a wholesome food is given to the child so the other nutrients will come from there Yes, I think that's been answered. And one last question, Dr. Raghu, you want to come in? I allowed you to ask your questions yourself. You want to switch on the mic and ask the last two questions that you posted? Okay, you don't have a mic. Okay, mechanistically, we should uh, see more iron deficiency than anemia in population, but it is the reverse in Indian context. Further, B12 and folate supplementation along with iron had no additional impact on hemoglobin levels. What's your comment? mechanistically you you say that iron deficiency is not an issue is it we should see more iron deficiency than anemia in population but it's reverse in india you say you see more anemia than iron deficiency so we have to now find out what is the cause for anemia other than iron deficiency isn't it so you have an answer for that See, there was a time some no, no. 50 years. No, no, sir. It is. It is, is other way, sir. It is from Ragu. Is is yeah, this question is, from Ragu? Yes, yes. Yeah. It is what the other is way, trying? Sir. That's what, sir. What he's trying to say is, uh, we see serum, uh, normal serum iron, but anemia in population. Yeah. It's the other way, sir. It is. What? It is the same thing. I mean, 50 percent of the people, 50 percent of anemic people actually do not suffer from anemia because of want of iron, but it's because of want of other nutrients. So that's what yeah, I yeah. think uh, is. Yeah. Other nutrients, exactly. Yeah. Other nutrients you audible, have to sir? reach them through other sources. Yes, Raghu, you are audible. We are talking about millets and other things, isn't it? Raghu, you yourself can a... pose the question. Yes, yes, sir. Normally, what will happen when? Put your person... video on. Video is not there, ma'am. Audio. Okay, sir. okay. Talk okay, a little okay. loud. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. When a person is a normal person with good iron stores and hemoglobin is put on iron deficient diet. Their ferritin levels will go down and hemoglobin maintains. When you start giving them iron, their hemoglobin goes first. After hemoglobin saturates, the ferritin levels go up. That means in a population that is likely to be suffering from anemia that is responsive to iron, we should find at least two to three fold iron deficiency compared to anemia. 
That means if anemia is 30%, we expect 90% iron deficiency. But it is not the case. In India, if anemia is 40%, iron deficiency is 30%, iron deficiency anemia is only 15%. And if you are only 15%. So that, 15%. So that that's, other nutrients are inadequate. That, that is what I'm saying. When yeah. we know that only 15% population. Correct. So what is your what is your solution viral. then? What is your solution? Ma'am, your mic is off. Sir, so what is it, what? sir, simply put, sir, simply put what he says is elsewhere when you supplement iron. Uh, hemoglobin improves and then iron stores improve. Whereas in India, typically you see the stores improve first. So why okay. that is happening? So what he's saying is there is so, so much iron around already. No, no. You said the iron stores are low. And when you give iron, the stores improve. But it is not translating into an increase into in hemoglobin. hemoglobin. Right? The and conversion, so you the, the utilization oh. of iron to yes. form RBCs with hemoglobin involves other nutrients as well. So we have to therefore ensure that other people, other nutrients are also available through some of the other foods. So, so you are only providing staple as fortification. This does not mean that they can eat only the staple and not have anything else. But that's what we believed, sir, for a long time, that there are hematinic nutrients, possibly we are deficient. But there are at least two big studies in India where folic acid and B12 were supplemented along with iron, but there is no improvement in hemoglobin. And our experience in NIN RCTs is that when we supplement iron-fortified foods, there is absolutely no change in hemoglobin. It only How long? Iron. How long? We have found that when we did that uh, study in that uh, school study, we yes. have got good improvement. What uh, Hemlat was referring, no, sir, both no. the control group and the iron fortified rice group both improved. Iron fortified rice had a significant improvement. Rampa Chowder own study, we found there's a significant improvement. You look at all our NIN earlier studies, there is improvement. Here and there, you have some issues which you have to go into the depth and find out the cause. So that doesn't mean that Iron should not be provided because you don't have the answer for the other things. No, but my worry is we are improving stores, but not hemoglobin. That's why I said you have to monitor. You have to have a post-marketing monitoring. You can do a whole lot of studies monitoring once fortification is uh, open. You have, you have a gold mine there for you to research, find out, and if you if you are if we come up with a great hypothesis, we'll stop fortification. No, sir. Uh, like, yeah, uh, uh, sir, I, I think uh, Dr. Raghu, sorry to interrupt you, but then I think we are already uh, 20 minutes Thank beyond you, our uh, set time. So I think uh, you would continue the discussion with Dr. Sheshkar and he's a, a local man for all of us. Okay, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, at this point, uh, uh, with the permission of the director, I think uh, we'll end this particular webinar. Uh, and I would request uh, my colleague, Dr. Sureka, to propose a vote of thanks. Dr. Sireka, please. Thank you very much, sir. Thank that was you. really wonderful talk. Well, thank you talk. for this opportunity. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you so much. And please share your slides also. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. I will. I'll send it right away. Yeah. Dr. Sireka, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, on behalf of the organizing secretary and coordinator, Dr. P. Uday Kumar, and on my own, I start by thanking the director of NIN, Dr. Hamleta Ma'am, for the smooth conduct of this webinar and also for an immense support and encouragement. Thank you very much, ma'am. I profusely thank uh, Professor uh, Vimal Karani for delivering such a wonderful and thought provoking lecture on an important topic like nutrigenomics in today's scenario, and also agreeing to deliver the talk despite his punishing schedule. I sincerely thank Dr. Shashikan, sir, for giving an excellent talk on adolescent nutrition and food fortification with micronutrients in your classic signature style, sir, and pace. Uh, and also for giving such a wonderful talk at a short notice. I thank Dr. G.M. Subharao and Dr. Bharti Kulkarni, who as members of organizing committee, helped in organizing this webinar efficiently and making it a success. I thank all my senior and fellow scientists, technical staff, PhD scholars, postdocs of NIN and other participants for participating actively in this webinar. And last but not the least, I thank Ms. Gautami and the technical team, 
Dr. Rajini Peter, Mr. Rahul, Mr. Naresh from IT division and from Mr. Devendran, artist, for the unstinted support at all odd times. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll meet tomorrow again for the uh, other uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank so you. Tomorrow all. the time also it is better to announce. Yeah, three to uh, three to four thirty. Uh, this is with regard to COVID. We'll be meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm ending the meeting now. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, sir.